you, Ray, for that lovely introduction. When, since I've known May since she was a graduate student, I couldn't possibly find an invitation to come and speak to you today. Uh, I had no particular idea what in the world I might have to say. Uh, and here we have a large number of dedicated chemical ecologists hoping to hear something interesting. And I congratulate you all for appearing at 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, congratulate myself for being awake at 8 o'clock in the morning. And I thought, well, if we're going to talk about the history of chemical ecology, we might as well begin at the beginning. And uh, I've always wondered, since chemical ecology deals with uh, the chemical interactions between organisms and nature, uh, I thought it would be interesting to spend five minutes reviewing where do our chemicals actually come from. And that takes us back as far as one could possibly go. Uh, and let me see. It does not respond. Ah, it does respond. So, as far as our own group goes, we have, we have a relatively short history. We're going to celebrate uh, mainly the contributions of John Simeone and, uh, and Bill Silverstein in founding our Journal of Chemical Ecology and the Society of Chemical Ecology itself, which are 40 and 30 years ago. Uh, but going back to, to where our chemicals come from, the history of that is really rather interesting, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, uh, but it, it's, it's worth repeating. <coughs> This gentleman, who looks a little bit to me like Groucho Marx, I can hardly believe that she really looked like that. But Alexander Friedman, not a terribly well-known guy, was in fact the first person to realize that our universe is expanding. And he published that in 1922. Uh, a person who followed up on that and is extremely important in, in the history of science is, is George Lemaitre. And George Lemaitre, had the idea that if our universe is expanding, then if one thinks in the other direction and thinks backwards, it must have been much smaller at one time. And it occurred to him that there must have been a time when the universe was essentially a point uh, from which everything from which everything came. The uh, mentor was a very interesting guy. He was he was a priest his whole life. He was at one stage uh, president of the Papal Academy. He was an advisor to the Pope. Uh, but he also had a PhD in, in astronomy from MIT. Uh, and extrapolating backwards, he, he is the person who introduced the idea of the Big Bang as the start of, of everything we have. Uh, in fact, he derived that from writings of, of Einstein. Einstein himself was, was not at first convinced that this was a proper interpretation of how the world works. Uh, but in fact, uh, Edwin Hubble, whose name you do all know in this context, was able to, to extrapolate from the fact that far away things have their spectra shift into longer wavelengths and he interpreted that as a sort of Doppler effect, meaning they're running away from us. Uh, and so it was Edwin Hubble who gets most of the credit. Uh, the problem of George Lemaitre was that he published in the Bulletin of the Brussels uh, Scientific Society. And the Brussels Scientific Society Bulletin was not widely read. So, so although he published that idea, uh, it, it was not really appreciated until Hubble did his spectroscopic studies and did the important work that we know about. Well, OK, so where do our chemicals come from? Well. Uh, the, the best sort of overall picture one can find now is that there was this cataclysmic event uh, about 13.8 billion years ago, uh, that shortly after that, and in that event, there appear on the scene what, what people seem to call a quark soup. And the quark soup is, is a, a plasma that's at, at trillions of degrees uh, trillions of Kelvin uh, and consists mainly of quarks and a microsecond after this initial event the quarks begin to come together and three of them can make a proton, three of them can make a neutron, so in one microsecond age of the universe 
we have our protons and neutrons. And in a hundred seconds, some of those come together and we actually have deuterium and helium and some, some actual elements. Uh, now, interestingly, that's about as far as chemical synthesis goes for a while. Uh, and essentially, after a hundred seconds, we have a universe that consists of about, uh, about 75% protons uh, and the, the rest neutrons. And they're so hot and so energetic that they don't get themselves together. It takes about a hundred seconds that the world has cooled off a bit. They finally make helium and deuterium and tiny amounts of lithium. And then the universe just sits around for a very, very long time. And uh, I think after, after some, maybe after a few minutes, uh, these, these nuclei, which are so hot that the electrons can't stick on them, the electrons essentially are boiled off. We, we have a sea of atomic nuclei for the first couple of elements. Those seas persist for a long time and finally begin to congeal into stars at 100 million years. Uh, at 500 million years, we have galaxies. Uh, and at 4 billion stars, 4 billion years, stars are still forming. And the universe is still essentially nothing but hydrogen and helium. So no chemicals to signal with, no chemicals to build organisms with. Uh, it's, a very, it's a very dull world. Well, it turns out that the stars that have formed, these initial stars, are enormous things. They're about 100 times the size of our sun. Uh, they don't have very long lives. Uh, and inside them, they are furnaces where heavier elements begin to be made. And in fact, uh, the elements up to, up to iron, my pointer doesn't point. Pointer is lazy. Okay. Ah, oh, is, is it pointing? Yeah, Oh, there it is. Anyway, elements up to iron uh, get made in the various stars. Uh, the stars at their end of their lives explode, and there's so much energy that more elements get made. Uh, the astronomers treat the periodic table from which we get all our chemistry in a very interesting way. They talk about hydrogen, helium, and everything else on the periodic table uh, is called a metal. So, uh, uh, this is a good one. So, everything beyond iron, all, all these elements uh, finally get made, and it takes explosions of stars to get enough energy to, to generate the periodic table. By the time our sun has formed, uh, we have the first 92 elements, which is all the stable elements they are. Uh, and it took many millions of years to get there. It's lucky that our sun was formed late enough that we have this full vocabulary of chemicals. Uh, and we can, we can do all kinds of things with them. <coughs> okay, uh, so finally we, we have our, our own solar system. It's equipped with 92 elements. And chemists begin trying to understand the world around them. An early, uh, very interesting chemist was, was Berzelius. And Berzelius, although he discovered a few elements, discovered five elements with his own hands, was also interested in, uh, was also interested in possibly applying chemistry to biology. Uh, he writes in a book uh, called Animal Chemistry uh, in 1806. He writes, of all the sciences contributing to medicine, chemistry is the primary one. Apart from the general light it throws on the entire art of healing, it will soon bestow on some of its branches a perfection such as one never could have anticipated. He wants to use chemistry to understand biological things, but his focus is entirely on medicine. It turns out that in 1806, there was no way in the world that could be done because one understood nothing about organic chemistry, one didn't understand that molecules were put together and had specific structures. Uh, it was a great insight of the biologist Louis Pasteur, uh, who realized that 
some pairs of molecules were mirror images of each other. And so Pasteur focused attention on what three-dimensional entities molecules were. Uh, the great chemist uh, Van Tuff realized that one could understand the fact that some molecules were mirror images of other by understanding that carbon atoms, when they are involved in compounds, uh, form tetrahedral structures, and that tetrahedral structures with different groups on the four corners of the tetrahedron can exist in right and left-handed forms. And organic chemistry began to move forward until we finally come to a point where it came to be understood that, that we ourselves are built of all these atoms that have taken so many billions of years to put together that we essentially draw mainly on this corner of the periodic table to get these atoms. The periodic table comes from the stars, as we, as we just talked. And now, now biologists are equipped to try to understand the world around them. Now, it's one thing to understand how the organisms are composed, and another thing to understand how they actually operate. And so then chemical ecology finally comes in. They learn about and adapt to the world about them by getting signals from light, from sound, and from chemistry. And we are going to talk about the developments in the uh, direction of chemistry. One of the earliest pairs of scientists working independently who realized that chemical signals can be very important in organismal behavior were Wilhelm Pfeffer and Theodor Engelmann. Uh, Engelmann, uh, back in the 1880s, uh, was a good friend of Johannes Brahms. And uh, in his own work, he, he studied the behavior of bacteria in response to oxygen and realized that in some circumstances, bacteria would swim towards oxygen. Uh, Pfeffer uh, did these very neat early experiments where he would fill a capillary tube. Oops. Uh, he would fill a capillary tube with possible attractants for bacteria or possible repellents and found that if you put uh, carbohydrates, if you put sugars in the tube, uh, that you could attract the bacteria to the mouth of the tube. They would actually swim into it. If you put repulsive chemicals and put the bacteria in the solution around the capillary, there would be a blank area where the bacteria were all escaping from the repellent chemicals. And in fact, this very early work uh, opened up the field of studying bacterial behavior uh, based on chemical responses. Uh, as we'll hear later today in the, in the second plenary lecture, lecture uh, not only do bacteria respond to external chemicals we provide to them, but of course they, they respond to signals that they generate themselves in a phenomenon, as you know, called core sensing. And Bonnie Bassler will tell us uh, very exciting things about uh, the consequences of core sensing in bacteria. And there, there are signals uh, which, are, which are relatively simple lactones. There's a signal which is a remarkable boron compound which have to do with both intra-species and inter-species communication in bacteria. So that area moved forward very well. The, the person who sort of resurrected the field of understanding bacterial communication is Julia Sadler. Uh, Julia Sadler was a, a close friend of my former colleague uh, Tom Eisner at Cornell. I think they may have been roommates at Harvard at one stage. They were both interested in insects. And at one stage, Tom tells me, uh, Julius came here and say, well, insects are too complicated, and the future is microbiology. <laughs> and indeed, in, in one sense, the future has been microbiology. This has been a tremendously uh, fruitful field for research. As I said, I began my uh, independent scientific career at, at Harvard, and one of the First problems I worked on, so this is a work that we published about 60 years ago, uh, with, without the benefit of biological collaborators, uh, was just a curiosity and for the fun of it. We thought it would be interesting uh, to look at a phenomenon that, that is well known to cat lovers, uh, and we wanted to see what is the active component 
uh, in catnip oil. Uh, as you know, cats love to roll, roll in catnip leaves. And indeed, we could like, uh, there was early work pointing to a component in catnip oil whose structure had not yet been determined. Uh, we spent some time determining that structure. It's a very simple structure. It turns out that there are lots of, there are now hundreds of compounds with this carbon skeleton. Uh, these are the so-called irioids that turn out to be quite important in, in lots of roles, both in the plant and insect world. Uh, we determine the structure using very old-fashioned methods of chemical degradation, and we'll come back to that, to that later on. Uh, it was after we did that work that a very distinguished former chair of the entomology department at Illinois, Berkeley Frankel, uh, pointed out to the world that all these terpenoid compounds, such as the metalactone that I just uh, mentioned to you, uh, are very likely defensive agents uh, produced by the plants and uh, defending them from herbivores. Uh, Gottfried Frankel himself, as I read his biography, I was struck by the fact that it's very much like that of Tom Eisner. They both came from Germany. They both did various things on their way to the US apparently discovering interesting problems anywhere they were. Uh, they were both enthusiastic musicians and pianists, and I was delighted to see that there was this distinguished history going on here. I'm going to talk in a little while about, about Tom Eisner, who really was a, a true pioneer and founder of, of modern chemical ecology. Uh, Tom Eisner came to Cornell about five years after I came there, uh, here he is, uh, a terrific musician. Uh, we've probably spent thousands of hours doing, doing music together. Uh, but we were introduced to one another by Howard Steinerman, who was also an entomologist at Cornell. And uh, Steinerman realized that Tom had all kinds of interesting problems in mind that required some chemical study. And he thought we could work on them together. I'll come to that. So, Tom and I uh, are one Tom and Jerry, he's another Tom and Jerry, and interestingly enough, here's Tom showing me snails and butterflies and, and beetles, and when I would typically meet Tom and we'd have lunch together in the faculty club, he would tell me a half dozen different stories about the lives of insects, uh, some of which would involve chemistry, and I would be slowly drawn into these, these wonderful, exciting stories, and I would be drawn into studying the chemistry of them. It was just about the time that we were getting started on our collaboration that uh, really chemical astrology studies of insects took off. And uh, this German cartoon says, Downs, Sie sprechen Französisch, two naturalists discovering that insects are talking to each other. But of course, they're not talking, they're not talking French, they're talking chemistry. And the person who really put that on firm ground was Adolf Putnam, shown here uh, in, in his old age. Uh, and in a way, the work of Putnam, which is often spoken of as, as uh, the start of an era, in another sense is the absolute end of an era. And in, in the following sense, that, well, Putnam's, one of his prime reasons for his success is he chose an insect that would be available in immense quantities of realizing that signal compounds that he was trying to go after were probably producing very small amounts. Uh, so he chose a silkworm moth because that's growing on mulberry leaves in, in enormous amounts. Uh, in typical experiments, Putnam would use 500,000 virgin females to search for the uh, sex attractant produced by these virgin females. It is uh, emanating from this gland at the tip of the female abdomen. And interestingly, uh, the reason this is the end of an era is Bhutanand, after a 20-year effort, was able to show that this very simple structure uh, was the, the attractant that the female silkworm moth produced. Now, the reason it's the end of an era is that this was determined entirely by classical chemical means. He discovered where the double bond was by actually a potassium permanganate oxidation and he could get butyric acid on this small carbon piece. 
So he would do chemical reactions to prove structures, and that was how structures used to be determined up till about this time, or a little short of that time. Uh, now, although this was an important piece of work in the sense that it, it attributed uh, insect behavior to, spe to specific chemical compounds, uh, for organic chemists, this is a hard structure to get excited about. It's just too simple, 16 carbons at a straight line. And so I think the impact of this on the chemical world was, was absolutely minimal. So although I'm going to be talking about sort of very vague high points in the history of chemical ecology, it's from a chemist's point of view. And I'm not going to talk about the great advances to the genomics or proteomics or those things. I'm going to talk about chemists. Uh, I think chemists hardly notice that this word went up at all. Uh, on the other hand, there were beginning to be researches, and now we're up to about the 1970s, where chemists got a tree. And it's interesting that what chemists are intrigued by are complex structures or things that would be hard to make or things that don't occur commonly. And so there's an absolutely wonderful piece of work uh, by Henry Rappaport and Leonard Maclis. And in looking in, reminding myself of the history of this, I discovered that Leonard Maclis was, in fact, an instructor in botany at the University of Illinois before he went to Berkeley. Uh, and Maclis, whose background was entirely in biology, was studying uh, signaling in, in a water mold, Alomyces. And he realized that the gametes, the female gametes of Alomyces attract male gametes. So there was a sperm attractant. And together with Henry Rappaport at Berkeley, they determined this structure for a molecule that Maclis called sirenin, after the sirens, uh, the female gametes being the sirens. And this did excite chemists. So within a year after this structure was published by Rappaport and Maclis, a very distinguished chemist all jumped in and was synthesizing cybernetic, because this, this was exciting. Among those chemists were E.J. Corey, who had been a great star in Illinois, then was stolen by Harvard, and John Katzenellen Rogan, who worked with Corey. I think this must have been his thesis work. Uh, and they published the synthesis of cybernetic. Uh, Corey moved to Harvard, and Katzenellen Rogan moved to Illinois, and there was a fair exchange. <laughs> and, and chemists now said, what do you know? Uh, organisms are using interesting and curious structures, and we will be more interested in this field than we all will notice this field. Uh, I want to tell a little bit. Oops. Time is going to be a problem. I want to tell a little bit about some of our own work with Tom Eisner and Ned Meinwell work. And I was going to tell you uh, probably my favorite uh, story uh, describing the work we did together. I'll just tell you the beginning and end of it. Uh, Tom said, well, you know, there's, there's this interesting work that, that Putin has started. But now everybody's looking at female pheromones. And in fact, they all seem to be very similar to one another. And I understand that a chemist wouldn't be interested really in that. And also, there's not so much new we're going to find. But consider this wonderful uh, butterfly from Trinidad. This butterfly has, in the male, courtship organs or hair pencils that look like that. They seem to be involved in, in male signaling females. Uh, we looked into the chemistry of things produced on those organs and found this unusual, although simple structure. Uh, with two fire membranes and a nitrogen, and it struck me that that looked a lot like various well-known alkaloids that also have this pattern of two fire membranes and a nitrogen. Uh, we studied the behavior of a more easily accessible butterfly, the Florida queen butterfly, which also involved hair pencil signaling, and found in the Florida queen the very same unusual structure, and when we tried to do uh, bioassays about this structure, we discovered that homegrown male butterflies failed to produce this compound and also were unsuccessful in courting females. If we supplied the males 
with this compound that we synthesized, uh, they were then successful in their courtship of females. Uh, we wondered very much where this came from because it doesn't look like uh, an animal metabolite un unless it came from a plant source. And in, many years later, I was able to work with uh, Deepa Schneider, Carol Williams, two very distinguished people in the industry of intake science, uh, at a lab that we were directors of in, in Nairobi. And we studied the African monarch butterfly, uh, which is terrifically attracted to certain heliotropium species. And the, uh, it's only males. The males take in juices from the heliotropium species. And we, we were able to show that the males who uh, get heliotropium juices uh, court successfully, and those who don't cannot and that the heliotropium is laden with pyrrolizidine alkaloids containing the skeleton for that pheromone. Uh, Tom thought we could learn more about this by studying an insect that lived on a plant producing pyrrolizidine alkaloids. Uh, we've uh, then studied Udithysoidrix, who lives on Cotillaria seeds if he can. The moth is protected from enemies because it sequesters the alkaloids. Uh, we found that the eggs are also protected from, uh, from enemies and that if you analyze the eggs, you find that the mother has put alkaloid into the eggs. Uh, although we thought that was a new finding, here again is a little German cartoon uh, showing that other animals also can put in biochemicals into their eggs. In this case, it's the, it's the chicken who makes Easter eggs. Uh, for the Swiss candies by drinking alcohol, putting the alcohol into the egg. And so the idea of imbuing eggs with protective chemicals was not invented by us, but maybe by this, this cartoonist. Uh, well, it turns out if a moth can protect herself and protect her eggs by incorporating alkaloid that you get from plants into them, uh, what about moths who don't happen? To, what about females who don't happen to have any alkaloid content? Maybe because they couldn't find cotillaria seeds. Well, it turns out if she mates with the appropriate male, that she can make up for that deficiency. And we show that males actually transfer protective alkaloid to females in proportion to how much alkaloid the male himself has. Males who are very well protected give a very large nuptial gift to the female and males who do not have much alkaloid don't do well in protecting their offspring. And so an unprotected female would do very well to be able to place her courting male on this chart. Uh, it turns out that females can acquire, uh, can acquire alkaloid from males that they mate with because the male puts the alkaloid in the spermatophore and uses it to with the sperm. Uh, a female who's promiscuous and mates with many males can get alkaloid from each of them. And we did label three different males in this case with three different alkaloids, let them mate and then analyze single eggs, and we can show that what the female does is she sequesters the alkaloid from all three potential fathers and puts all of the different defensive chemicals she can get into her egg. It also turns out that uh, she protects herself from spiders and whatnot uh, by having chosen the right mate. So how does she know who the right mate is? These moths have, again, signaling organs, carimeter, and in this case, the moth uses a slightly different pyrrolizidine as a signal compound. And here's the monoprotein from which she gets it because she grew up on poisonous plants containing this. Now, you could view this as a, a very clever uh, signaling system, or an interesting way of thinking about this, and I think a way that's worthwhile, is to say, if you're eating food that contains toxic components, you've got to get rid of those components somehow, or you'll, you'll just uh, be running over with plant toxins. And so one way to do that is to metabolize and excrete them. And so if you were building up this compound, there's a degradation product that you might safely eliminate. Uh, and it happens to have become a signal. And one could imagine then that really some signaling systems might just result uh, 
as a sort of byproduct, an incidental result of, of living your own life. You're living on a poisonous plant, you're protecting yourself, you're uh, squeezing your metabolites, and then once it's out, then fellow species members or anybody else can detect this signal and perhaps draw consequences from it. If you're a conspecific female, you could guess that if, if the male is secreting this, he had alkaloid to give you as a nuptial gift. That said, views, uh, views pheromone biosynthesis, at least in some cases, as a sort of incidental, incidental result of living one's own life and throwing away waste products. So there's a very interesting related Supreme Court case where police were analyzing the garbage of presumed uh, drug, drug dealers and finding remnants of the, of the drugs in, in the garbage. Uh, they tried, the drug people tried to defend themselves saying police had no right to live in our garbage, that's unfair. And Justice White, speaking for the majority, uh, declared that people have no subjective expectation of privacy in their garbage. That if, if you put things out into the world, that anybody is allowed to look at the police or anybody else. And so, uh, so that's very interesting. So that means the moths are doing something perfectly legal. <laughs> and in, in this view of, of signaling, then the moths are, are sort of being Sherlock Holmes. They're, they're sniffing around, learning what they can from chemicals around them. And they may be pheromones, or they may be alcohols, or they may be different. And there may be all sorts of things, and uh, they're being exploited. Uh, one of the, uh, the wonderful things about chemical ecology is it deals with such a hugely wide range of phenomena, and <clears throat> the piece of work that's really quite beautiful uh, comes from the lab of Baldomero Oliveira, and I'm sure many of you know this, who worked on cone snails. He began his work in the Philippines, where he came from, he wanted to study something that was readily available. Uh, cone snails, which have been known for hundreds of years to be fearfully toxic, looked like a good thing for, for him to study while he was in the Philippines. Uh, if you look at their toxins there, this is a chromatograph, they, they seem to have many, many components. They're very complicated. Uh, they're beautiful creatures. Uh, their method of using their toxins is, is absolutely out of this world. Uh, it's amazing that a sort of sedentary snail can feed itself on fish. And how in the world do they do it? These cone snails harpoon fish and inject them with, with their neurotoxins. They can paralyze a fish in less than 10 seconds and then slowly draw the fish in and, and digest it. Now, as I said, these are very, very chemically challenging mixtures and uh, what the Oliveira group did is look at each of these chromatographic components and what they found is that each had a very specific uh, neurobiological activity affecting neuromuscular junctions or affecting different things about how the nerve works. And uh, these, some of these compounds have now proven to be, to be wonderful things for treatment of chronic pain or for other uh, neurological diseases. It's, it's been a very important area. The structures themselves are now a true challenge, but they're, they're all uh, various polypeptides uh, tied up into specific conformations by sulfur-sulfur bonds. Very recently, so interesting things are still going on. Uh, there's an interesting paper that just came out about a month or two ago in, in PNAS uh, by Sugimoto and co-workers. He was studying communication between tomato plants. It was not novel to discover that uh, cis-3-hexenol uh, production is turned up when the tomato plant is attacked by cutworms. Uh, and then other plants respond by defending themselves. Interestingly, the main defensive compound that appears in the recipient plant is a glycoside of the three Hexenol, hexenol, and most interesting, 
you would say, well, they got the message and turned up production of this thing. But actually, they used the very messenger substance itself to build the defensive compound. And that's known because Tsubimoto deuterium labeled the hexenol from the signaling plant. And then he showed that the, the defensive compound in the recipient plant, this glycoside of the hexenol, in fact, was made from the deuterated hexenol it got as a message. So you get this piece of paper with the message on it, this chemical. You say, ah, I should build a defensive compound out of this very molecule. And so here are plants helping one another in a remarkable way. I want to end by saying something about, about money. Uh, Tom and I were able to uh, carry on the work that we did very largely with, with uh, generous support from the NIH. So it comes in three year batches or in five year batches. But for over 50 years, uh, we had this support. And of course, as you know, one can't do much uh, without support. Here's Harvey Woodward. I'm not sure why I have that slide here, but it's a good picture of Harvey Woodward. Uh, oh, I wanted to talk about why uh, we had the, the great good fortune not only to have financial support, but to have been active at a time when science just became possible to study very small amounts of material. So when I was a grad student, uh, if you wanted to prove the structure of an unknown molecule, if you had 30 milligrams, uh, that would be a very small amount to do the job with, with a thing of any complexity at all. Uh, you could hardly work with much less than 30 milligrams. And that's a pretty small amount, 30 thousandths of a gram. But in fact, in terms of number of molecules, it's 6 times 10 to the 19th molecules. So now, six decades later, uh, with the development of NMR spectroscopy, of mass spectroscopy, uh, increased sophistication of X-ray crystallography, uh, with 3 micrograms, uh, which is 10 to the 4th less, uh, you could be able to determine quite a few structures. And the jump from milligrams to micrograms brings many problems that couldn't have been studied when I was a grad student, couldn't have been studied at all, can now be studied. And one can be quite proud of doing a structure on three micrograms. But if you look at a number of molecules, and this is figuring a signaling compound with a molecular weight about 300, which is a typical small molecule molecular weight, three micrograms is six times 10 to the 15th uh, molecules. So although one can be proud of these small amounts, it's clear that there's a long way one could go. And if the past is any indication, uh, one could guess that in, in the next uh, moderate number of decades, probably we will go down to three nanograms or three picograms. And even then, I mean, these are unimaginable amounts to do structure work now. But in fact, it's still billions of molecules and so, undoubtedly, the chemical ecology of the future will work on, on really much smaller amounts. Also, what made current work easily possible is the development of chromatography. The fact that you can take a complex mixture, such as I showed you the Oliveira work involved, and separate into components, uh, that allows one to do chemistry on small amounts of pure components. On the other hand, there's no reason to imagine that one ought to be able to just take mixtures. And one could imagine three picograms of a mixture of 50 components and do the structures all at once by suitably sufficient, uh, suitably sophisticated spectroscopy. It's interesting that uh, if you listen to somebody whistle a tune, you can write down the notes and say, this is what the tune is made of. If you hear a, a Mahler symphony, even though the flute and the French horns and the clarinets and the violins are all playing at the same time, a good ear can pick out what each instrument is doing. And you can analyze terribly complex things without separating. And that will undoubtedly develop. And one can expect in the future of chemical ecology that the chemistry part is going to get very good. Maybe we'll get down to billions of molecules. Maybe we'll get down to femtograms that work on billions of molecules. But anyway, there's a lot of space uh, to move into. There are certain areas where chemical ecologists don't 
seem to have uh, made as much contribution as one might hope for. And I would expect in the future, say, uh, in, in connection with vector transmitted diseases, there could be wonderful collaborative opportunities uh, in working on diseases where clearly chemical communication is involved. Lyme disease, which is becoming a tremendous nuisance and a serious disease in this country, depends on ticks uh, finding us, well, finding each other to live their lives and finding us to transmit a bacterial, uh, bacterial infectious agent, a terrible disease, viral blindness, transmitted by black flies and transmits nematodes. It's a victim of this disease. These are the uh, invading nematodes. Schistosomiasis, and this is not a vector, this is an alternative host where the big flatworms live. Schistosomiasis in some areas is a terribly important disease. It involves a stage in the life cycle of the parasite where it's got four hours to find a snail host. It's not going to do that in random. It's clear that they, they get signals from the snail. Again, the snail is secreting something inadvertently that the parasite can follow. A chemical ecologist can do a wonderful job entering into the right collaboration. Uh, Charis disease also uh, an important insect vector. That's the Lyme disease one. That's the Charis disease one. This is really the same picture that the nematode emerging from the antennae of the, of the vector. Uh, there are wonderful opportunities here if, if people would continue to look for the right collaborators. Uh, either biologists look for chemists to help understand the life cycles of these creatures or the other way around. Uh, it's interesting to see how, how chemical ecologists have been faring in the world. The society was founded in 1984 and had 575 members. And that number has gone up to almost 700 down to about 250. But in fact, uh, it's, it's basically stayed the same. In 2014, there are less of us than there were uh, 30 years ago when the society was founded. Uh, in the words of uh, William Finn and James uh, Lapine, who wrote a wonderful musical called Falsettos, uh, we are a teeny tiny band. Uh, we, we chemical ecologists. Here we are, uh, under 600 people, trying to study this diversity of interesting scientific problems. Uh, we haven't changed the number in 30 years significantly. The American Chemical Society, on the other hand, uh, in 84 had 133,000 members and now has 161,000 members. You can see how few of these chemists uh, consider themselves chemical ecologists. The world population has gone up a lot, but we are frozen in this teeny tiny stage. What would the ideal world for chemical ecology look like? Uh, suppose you took all 500 of us and, and you gave us half a million dollars uh, a year. Uh, how much money would that take? It would take $250 million annually. And say over a 10 year period, it would be two and a half billion dollars. You could essentially support comfortable research groups, five man research groups plus a director for the entire world community of chemical ecologists. Uh, well, 250 million dollars is a lot of money. Uh, but we do things in the world that, that take lots of money, and sometimes we do them uh, quite gracefully. Uh, if you're interested in opera, uh, it's, it's interesting to note that the annual budget of the Paris Opera is $263 million. Uh, that's just about what we're talking about. Uh, <laughs> with Brazil, we're preparing for the World Cup. It built, it, it built a whole bunch of stadia. Here's one of them. I think this is the one in Rio. Uh, it costs over three million over $300 million. Uh, so we spend money on opera, we spend money on sports, we spend money on military things. This is an American bomber in, in common use, uh, or common production in our country. It's $2.4 million. Uh, submarines, we apparently buy, uh, buy, buy, the, buy the package, and we, we've just committed ourselves uh, to 10 Virginia-class submarines 
to the glorious price of, of $17 billion. Uh, not only us, India has just signed a contract for 126 fighter planes, $18 billion. Uh, so, human beings can undertake very expensive projects and, and carry them off. Uh, if you build one less if you built one less B-2 bomber, that would be two point, that would be two point four thousand billion dollars or two and a half billion dollars for the price of one of these. You could you could support this entire subject worldwide for ten years and imagine what we would learn about basic science, about our microbiome, about what bacteria are doing in the soil about what these vector-borne diseases are doing, about all, all these wonderful things. Uh, and you might hardly miss one of these B2s. I wouldn't miss it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the future we could hope for, because we're not going to quite see that future. And it's not clear what we can do even to approach it. But uh, it is uh, the people in this room, in fact, who are going to both benefit from it and do their best to get these resources so that we can study uh, not only all these useful things, but study the great beauty that nature offers us. And now my time is up, and I thank you so much for listening to me.